Welcome to St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bridgeport, Ohio, on the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. We are doing a short online service. Pastor Nancy DiStefano will be remote and, we will, and will deliver the gospel and the sermon. This service has been pre-recorded. Whether watching on Facebook or YouTube, be sure to leave a comment, like, subscribe, and share. This helps them know that we are here. All churches want to grow. Speaking of growing, we want to wish a very happy birthday to the following this week. Heather Kasky and Spencer Zink on the 6th, John Thomas and Eliza Votris on the 7th, and Eileen Nesberly on the 12th. Game night is scheduled for Tuesday, February 8th at 5 p.m. here at St. Paul's, while the Bible study of James, the book of James, is scheduled for Wednesday here at 6 p.m. If you are regulars with these groups, they will contact you if they are canceled this week. Thank you. Prepare your hearts and minds for worship, and we will start with the prayer of the day. Most holy God, the earth is filled with your glory, and before you, angels and saints stand in awe. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world, and by your grace, make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the first reading is from Isaiah 1 to 8 and 9 to 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphims were in attendance above him, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraphim touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until the cities lie waste, without inhabitant, and the houses without people, and the land is utterly des desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will burn again. Like the terabithan, or an oak, whose stump remains standing when it, when it is fill, felled. The holy seed is in the stump. The word of the Lord. 
The psalm today is Psalm 138. Read along with me. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and praise your name because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, yet cares for the lowly, perceiving the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of troubles, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your purpose for me. O oh Lord, your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe the word of the Lord. Welcome. And I'm so glad to be able to come to you via media instead of in person, although I prefer in person. I'm glad that we have this technology available to us. I'll read to you the gospel passage from our lectionary this week, which is Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. The gospel of our Lord. <laughs> Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, 
Master, we've worked all night long, but have not caught anything. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. Well, I am titling my message today, Trusting God for the Catch. You can probably guess that I'll be talking about fish and fishing as we take a look at our gospel reading from Luke. But before I do that, I'd like to consider a topic from our Old Testament passage, trees. I was asked recently how trees use the internet. And I, I couldn't think. And the, then finally they told me, oh, they log on. Uh, just uh, one more, I was also asked what trees wear to a pool party. And of course the answer is swimming trunks. My, if my husband was here, he'd have his drum be going. <laughs> in our Old Testament passage in Isaiah 6, the Lord tells the prophet that God is about to cause the people's ears and eyes to be shut and their minds to be made dull until cities lie waste and the land is utterly desolate. In verse 13, God says, even if a tenth part of it remain, it will be burned again like a terebinth tree or an oak tree whose stump remains standing when it's felled. Maybe today, if we were to put it in today's term, we'd say, even when the substation goes down, there's still a power plant there that someday will give us some power for our houses and electric for our electrical needs. So many of us have been struggling without any power lately. But uh, let's concentrate for a minute on uh, what is said here. Isaiah tells us the holy seed is its stump. Even when God takes us through difficulties, there remains this stump at the base of everything called a holy seed. You know, we have a wonderful example of this in the United States. It's a tree in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It's an 80-year-old American elm. It, and is a huge, huge tourist attraction. Uh, you might not understand why, but people pose for pictures beneath this tree and arborists carefully protect her. She adorns posters and letterheads and the city treasures the tree, not because of her appearance necessarily, but because of her endurance. She made it through the Oklahoma City bombing. Timothy McVeigh parked his death-laden truck only yards away from this tree. His malice killed 168 people, wounded 850 more, and destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building and finally buried the tree in a pile of rubble. No one expected this tree to survive. No one gave any thought to the dusty branch stripped tree that stood there after all of that. But then the tree began to bud. Sprouts pressed through the damaged bark, green leaves pushed away the gray soot. Life rose from that acre of death. 
people noticed. And the tree became a sign or a model of resilience for the victims, uh, a sign they desperately needed. So they named her the survivor tree. You know, sometimes circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans for our lives, we feel, but God is not helpless. God is not helpless even among the ruins. Our broken lives are not lost and useless. God's love is still working. I don't know what you're going through or you've been through, but some of you may have experienced that, that God comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan, a plan of love. You could probably guess, uh, again, from my title, Trusting God for the Catch, that I'm referring to the story in Luke's gospel where Jesus tells Simon Peter to put out into deep waters and to let down the nets for a catch. Simon owned one of the boats that were sitting there after a long night of fishing as Jesus began to talk to some of the crowds and it just got so, so crowded and the people pressed again against him so much that he decided to climb into one of these boats, a boat belonging to Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little bit into the water where he sat and taught from the shores of Lake Gennesaret or uh, the Sea of Galilee, we know it as. So uh, we have this wonderful picture of Jesus teaching along the shores. We, uh, we read in here that he told him to put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch uh, because the people wanted to hear the word of God they pressed against him. And I, I, that phrase catches my attention. They wanted to hear the word of God. I think sometimes in the church today, we're afraid people no longer want to hear the word of God. Uh, we, we get worried that it's becoming passe or something. We forget that all of us have this God-shaped vacuum inside of us. The one that God has placed within us that uh, demands, that calls out to us all through our lives to be filled only by the Lord himself. So I think sometimes in the church, we worry that people will stop wanting to hear the word of God. We forget that God is the one in control, the one that's drawing us and, and uh, that's driving the plan of what goes on in the world. Uh, even when evil tries to take things over, so we see this, and sometimes our eyes and our ears and our understanding are dulled like the people in Israel in the days of Isaiah. And we get to a place where we just want to ask, oh, Lord, how long, how long is this going to be? Isaiah just seen this incredible vision. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, a wonderful king in Israel, a king that had blessed their country. And he was now gone, and the people didn't know what was about to happen. But God gave Isaiah a vision. He got, got a vision of this king high and lifted up. His train was so long that it filled the entire temple. And there were angels, seraphim, it says, six-winged seraphim, that uh, two, two wings covered their eyes, two covered their feet, and two they flew with. And they were at the Lord's side there in the Lord's temple with the train filling it. And a magnificent vision. And yet the Lord says, I'm about to, you know, go ahead and preach, but they're not going to listen. They're going to have their ears shut and their eyes blinded and they're not going to understand. And, and, and Isaiah says, how long, Lord, how long are we going to have to endure this? terrible way things are but God had a plan and he's saying there's a stump left I have something left that will give you hope that gives you hope that uh, there's something better coming in the future so 
in this process of seeing the vision, uh, Isaiah says, when he finally sees the power of the Lord and smoke is filling the room and the vibrations start to rattle the pivots of the very joints of the door, he says, woe is me, I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the Lord, the King, the Lord of hosts. We find a repeat of this deep humility that Isaiah was experiencing in the case of Peter. When Simon Peter obeys Jesus and he uh, puts out into deeper water and he throws out the net, he takes in a catch of fish that is unbelievable. So heavy that it's breaking the boat, that it's sinking the boat and they have to call their friends, breaking the nets and sinking the boat. They have to call their friends over and get another boat to put the fish in. So Peter falls down on his knees and he says, go away from me, Lord, go away from me. I am a sinful man. It's interesting to me that when we really see the power of God, we are suddenly deeply humbled and recognize, wow, God is much bigger and stronger and more powerful and more holy than anything I could ever be. And yet God calls us uh, to put out into deeper, riskier waters. And when we cast our nets, as the Lord tells us, we begin to see amazing things. We will also recognize our frailty and sin in the face of God's power. Jesus tells Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. This is the point in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus turns from doing the works of God and uh, just doing things on his own to begin to doing things in tandem with the disciples and inviting others to join him in the work of the kingdom. Up until now, the disciples like Andrew and Simon Peter were just kind of following Jesus along, partially, I think, out of amazement for who they thought he might be, or just out of curiosity to wonder if uh, this was real, all this stuff they were seeing, all the miracles. But now Jesus is calling his disciples to leave everything leave everything and follow him. As these new disciples of Jesus begin to see the power and the divinity of Christ, uh, they have a radical life change. And the church of Jesus Christ begins to grow. Do you wanna see the church grow? Uh, we talk about that. Uh, then we need to open our eyes and see what God is doing in our life and in the lives of people around us and uh, to do what God is calling us to do. Step out in faith and do it. The church growth is on our minds a lot. I hear a lot of people talk about it. Uh, or should I say church decline and stagnation is what they talk about. Um, and it's on our minds a lot. Uh, some of us are doing the very best we know how to do. And God bless you, whoever you are. Uh, I know that many of you are trying to do the best you can do. But truth be told, we are not getting too many people in most churches these days. And thank goodness for social media and for the ability to reach out to people like this so that on days when we can't meet together because of nasty weather or power outages, we can still talk to one another. So reaching out is what we have to do. And uh, other people like to defend the fact that the church has declining numbers in some places and say, well, it isn't about quantity, it's about quality. But uh, let's face it, there are still a lot of people who do not know that God loves them and that, that still don't know the salvation offered to us through the life and death of Jesus Christ. We have a lot of work to do. 
sometimes we make excuses and say, well, it's too hard to get people to go to the church uh, on weekends. Everybody has things to do on the weekends and uh, people don't want to go to church anymore. I hear a lot of this negativity. Then there are the pessimists who say, the world is just going downhill in a handbag. Uh, there is nothing we can do about it. Well, the enemy wants us to think that way. He loves when we think that way. He wants us to be afraid. And many times we buy into it. We're afraid of really doing evangelism and believing God to put out into deeper waters and cast our nets. We're afraid that uh, God will use us to actually speak truth and healing into the lives of others. Sometimes we, we just can't believe it because we feel like, Peter, uh, go away from me, Lord. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinful man. Some of us are a little bit like the little boy, the four-year-old who spilled his drink on the floor and insisted on trying to clean it up by himself. And his mother explained that the best way to do that is to go out and get the mop outside off the back door. So the little boy ran to the back door and he suddenly stops. And he looks fearfully at his mother and says, but mommy, it's dark outside and I'm afraid. And his mother lovingly explained that there's nothing to be afraid of because Jesus is always with us. And he's there to help us, even outside when it's dark. So the little boy opened the back door, stuck his head out and shouted, Jesus, if you're out there, please hand me the mop. <laughs> Jesus said to us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Let's remember we serve a holy God, a God who has sent his son to die for us. Let's remember that. And then like Isaiah, let's say, here I am, Lord, send me. And now the prayers of intercession. The spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold, to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Equip your church to proclaim the good news that we have first received the forgiveness and grace shown to us through Jesus Christ. Send us out as apostles, sharing the hope of your salvation with a waiting world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Holy are you, O God of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Revel your splendor in fiery sunsets and in deep blue twilights. Teach us to recognize you in the beauty of our natural world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Soften the hearts of the rulers and governments that they receive and tend to the needs of their people, remove corruption and the impulse towards violence, protect first responders and military personnel who risk their lives in the service of others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon those who look to you for hope and healing. Bless doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists, and all caregivers. Draw near to those who are scared, sick, or in pain. God of grace, hear our prayer. The disciples received help from partners as they brought in an abundant catch of fish. So strengthen this congregation's partnership with community organizations and ministries. Multiply our shared efforts and bring joy to our relationship. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
Lord, we pray for your church in all its various expressions. We lift up the ELCA, its bishops and pastors that serve through word and sacrament, and we lift up a few from our membership and family. Arden and Jean Watson, Bob and Jane Weaver, Roger and Donna Weaver, Tammy, Stefan, Ray, Kelsey Weaver, and Demetrius Ray. We give thanks for our ancestors in faith who boldly answered your call. By their example, give us courage to live in faith, to proclaim your mercy until the day that you gather us into your glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Son. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For in your glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to say thank you for watching today and for sharing, spending time in the word with us. Go in peace, serve the Lord. And remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment so that they know we're out there. Thank you.